I want to start off by saying, uh, let's hear it for the Tibet Action Institute. I, I practiced some Tibetan today. Are there any Tibetans in here? Raise your hand if you're Tibetan, okay? Hello, Tibetans. Thank you for your work. I, uh, I think that we've all believed ever since, you know, uh, since I was a little boy, you know, when Nixon went to China, and since that time, we've always believed that the more the Chinese were exposed to our way of life, to our democracy, to our capitalism, to the Western world, that they would adopt our ideas, that they would become more like us. And that just hasn't happened in any way, shape, or form. And I'd love to speak to you about all these different groups that we are recognizing tonight. But I just want to join with all of you in congratulating a one particular agency for the work that they're doing and ask them to come and speak for themselves. Let's hear it again for the Tibet Action Institute. And Laden will come up and accept the award. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Swazi, very much for this um, incredible introduction. And thank you to the National Endowment for Democracy uh, for this incredible honor and for standing in steadfast solidarity with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people for decades. In June 1989, I was 13 years old, watching coverage of the students protesting in Tiananmen Square with my father. I will never forget the newfound feeling of hope and possibility that this could be the moment that would change everything. That might mean my dad could go home again to Tibet after 30 years in exile. At that point, Tibet had been rocked by protests for nearly two years, and martial law had been declared in Lhasa that March. Just weeks later, seeing a million Chinese citizens taking to the streets, it seemed as if change had to be imminent. But that opportunity for change was lost, and not just because of the crackdown, but because in the years that followed, the free world lost its way in holding Beijing accountable. This happened in large part because we started ignoring what this authoritarian power was capable of. We allowed Chinese leaders to hijack critical discussions about rights, muting nearly all public debate, and eventually to even write the terms of engagement. Clearly, we got it wrong, and every day makes it clear just how wrong. Faced with the escalating crisis of repression today, I believe we must ask ourselves, what can we do differently? The answer lies at the heart of what the students did in Tiananmen Square and what the Tibetans did in Lhasa in 1989. The answer lies in courageous, principled, unyielding action to fight for what is right. If six million Tibetans, armed with nothing more than nonviolent resistance, and the Buddhist monk as their leader can stand up to China time and time again, so can the rest of the world. As they have shown us, we have to speak truth to power, using every tool and avenue available to engage in bold, creative, and strategic resistance. And as part of this, like-minded governments need to confront China as one, engaging in joint public initiatives to support Tibetans and all others fighting for their rights and freedom. We are here today not just to mark a historic moment or because things have gotten so much worse, but because we have to act, to right the wrongs of the past and to pick up from that moment 30 years ago that was alive with hope and possibility and this time to get it right. Thank you. <laughs> 